Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and Happy New Year to you and your family, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy on EWTN. Like Moses, Jesus ascended on a mountain to bring a rule for living to the people. He showed them how to find permanent bliss that nothing can take away, not sickness, not poverty, nor persecution. What he gave us is called the Beatitudes. But what do they mean? We are The Sermon on the Mount is not one sermon, but a summary of all of Jesus' sermons. That's what makes it so powerful. After going up the mountain, Jesus sat because when a Jewish rabbi was teaching officially, he sat. It's like when the Pope teaches and speaks ex cathedra, meaning from the chair, which means an official church teaching has been given. The heart of Jesus' message in the Beatitudes is that we can live a very happy life both in this world and in the next. The call to holiness, to be saints, can be found in these eight Beatitudes. Jesus is giving the believer his Beatitudes, the attitudes he should be. The word beatitude literally means joy or blessedness, but they are a sign of contradiction to the world's understanding of happiness and joy. Remember, happiness and joy are different. Happiness is just an outward expression. I will be happy if the Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl, but that will never give me true joy. Joy is an internal fulfillment that only God can give. That's why Thomas Aquinas said, no one can live without joy. That is why a person deprived of spiritual joy goes after carnal pleasures. So let's look at the eight Beatitudes. One is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor or helpless man who has no earthly resources puts his whole trust in God alone. He will be detached from all other things, for he knows things cannot bring true joy. He will become attached to God, for he will know that God alone can bring help and hope. Now, ironically, it is known that those with less money often support the church of God more. Um, we are also poor, as the Beatitude says, because we don't even have anything spiritually to offer God without his help. The man who is poor in spirit realizes that things mean nothing, but God means everything. So if we have nothing, we must trust God, and it is that trust that leads to obedience and salvation, the ultimate joy. All right, second, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Arabs have a proverb, all sunshine makes a desert. Yes, a place where the sun always shines will become an arid desert where no fruit will grow. There are certain things which only cloudy days and rains can produce. Blessed is the man who is sorry and mourns for his own sin and unworthiness. Remember, Jesus' first message was repent, and no man can repent unless he mourns for his sins. Christianity begins with a sense of sin. You know, the greatest sin is the loss of the sense of sin, according to Pius XII. And that is why the broken and the contrite heart is one God will never despise. The way to the joy of being forgiven is through the desperate sorrow of your broken heart. Third, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek does not mean weak, but it is rather strength under control. Blessed is the man who is angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. It is never right to be angry for an insult or injury done to ourselves, but it is often right to be angry at injuries done to others. 
Selfish anger is always a sin, but selfless anger can be justified, like Jesus' anger at the money changers in the temple for cheating the people. Meekness is also seen as humility. Without it, man cannot learn. The first step to learning is the realization of our own ignorance. So without humility, there can't be true learning, or for that matter, even religion, because religion begins with a realization of our need for God, our lack. Okay, number four, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do we want goodness as much as a starving man wants food or a dying man wants water? The blessed is not necessarily the man who achieves goodness. It is the man who longs for goodness with his whole heart. David had always wished to build the temple of God, yet he never achieved it. It was denied him. But God said to him, you did well, David, in that you desired it in your heart. Even if a man never fully attains goodness, if he longs for it, he can still be blessed. Remember, saints are simply sinners who keep on trying. Okay, number five, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This is the key. The New Testament and the Our Father prayer insist that to be forgiven, we must also forgive. James says, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. It is more than pity. It denotes sympathizing with others until we feel what they feel. In Jesus Christ, God literally got inside the skin of men to feel their suffering. Jesus saw with men's eyes. He felt with man's emotions. He thought with a human mind. As Father Kosicki always said, divine mercy is having pains in your heart for the pains of another and taking pains to do something about their pain. It is making their suffering your own, like St. John Vianney, who did the penances for his people. Mercy is not just a matter of giving gifts uh, to the poor or money, but it, it is loving them. It is loving them despite whatever defects they may have. It is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. That is what being merciful is and what will bring us mercy from God. Okay, the sixth, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We must have purity in our intentions when we do something. Mercy alone is not sufficient. In fact, um, a very giving or generous person may also engage in very lustful activities, for example. Even if we do good, we may not be free from the feeling that men will praise us or admire us. We must ask ourselves, is our work done from motives of service or from motives of pay? We could ask, is our service given from selfless motives or from motives of self-display? Or we could ask, is the work we do in church done for Christ or for ourselves, for our own prestige? We must be free from all attachments to creatures and their opinions of us and exclusively attached to God instead. That is why Jesus said, only the pure in heart will see God. Okay, the last two, number seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peace is not just the absence of war. It means enjoying all that is good. Peace in the Bible does not come from evading issues. It comes from facing issues like David with Goliath, dealing with them and conquering them with love. Like remember, admonish the sinner do it with love. That is, this is not the passive acceptance of things because we are afraid of confrontation. It is the active facing of things and the making of peace, even if we struggle. 
Blessed are those who make this world a better place for all men to live in, even at a heavy price. Now the eighth and last beatitude is blessed are those persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Christianity often came not to bring peace, but a sort of division. We have to love Christ more than even our spouse or our children. There will be division of all kinds. Today, we enjoy the blessing of liberty because the men before us died for it on the battlefield when division faced them. Uh, the Boulder Dam, for example, cost many lives, but that project turned a dust bowl into fertile land. Yes, it was a struggle, but one that benefited those who came later. It is the same with our martyrs who were persecuted. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's why 2 Timothy 3 says, All who want to live a holy life in Christ Jesus will have persecution. So let's pray for persecuted Christians around the world, especially the priests and religious being killed in Nigeria today, simply because they are Christian. With almost 100,000 Christians killed every year for their faith, they are definitely persecuted for righteousness sake, but the kingdom of heaven will be theirs. Now, let's visit Our Lady of Champion in Wisconsin. This is a special place where Mary appeared and the Beatitudes came alive. On a cold day in December 1669, Jesuit missionary Father Claude Alouez journeyed along the Wisconsin waterways to anchor on the bank of the Encanto River. On December 3rd, 1669, Assisted by Native Americans, he celebrated the first mass in that territory, an area that would become the Diocese of Green Bay. 200 years later, miraculous events would occur there, involving a 28-year-old Catholic Belgian woman, an immigrant named Adele Brees. When she made her first Holy Communion, she and her friends made a promise to the Blessed Virgin Mary that they would become teaching sisters in Champion, Belgium. When she was 24 years old, her parents asked her to come with them. They had decided to emigrate to America. It took about six weeks to get to northeastern Wisconsin, and one of Adele's many jobs was to carry grain to the grist mill to be ground into flour. And on one of these trips, standing between what appeared to be a maple and a hemlock tree, she saw a beautiful lady clothed in dazzling white, and Adele didn't know what to make of it. It was on this third encounter that Adele would find out who the lady was and the special mission she was entrusting to her care. I am the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners, and I wish you to do the same. You received Holy Communion this morning, and that is well, but you must do more. Make a general confession and offer communion for the conversion of sinners. If they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. And then Our Lady asked Adele, what are you doing here in idleness while your companions are working in the vineyard of my son? What more can I do, dear lady, asked Adele. Gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. Teach them their catechism, how to sign themselves with the sign of the cross and how to approach the sacraments. That is what I wish you to do. Go and fear nothing. I will help you. So Adele would go door to door doing chores and teaching the children their catechism. And the parents were learning too. In time, she attracted companions to help her in this work, and eventually people came forward with their skills and their resources to build a convent, a school, and another chapel to replace the one that her father had built on the spot of the apparition. Adele just trusted that God would take care of her and take care of this mission she was given, and he always did. The greatest challenge, of course, was the Great Peshtigo Fire. And it happened on October 8, 1871, one day short of the 12th anniversary of the apparition. It was very hot and dry that year. This particular day, it was very windy. And once the fire began, it became a hurricane of fire. 
the internal winds were 80 miles an hour. The people threw themselves into whatever water source that they could find. And so many of the people that died, died of hypothermia. And so when the people from this area saw the fire, many of them fled here. And when they got here, they found that the children and the sisters were already praying the rosary in the chapel. At some point, they went outside of the chapel, carrying the statue, praying the rosary. And when the fire got too hot in one direction, they simply turned and went in another. And they just prayed the rosary over and over again until they were utterly exhausted. Shortly after midnight on the 12th anniversary of the apparition on October 9th, a steady rain began to fall. What they found the next morning was truly amazing. It was a miraculous answer to prayers. Fire came right up to the fence posts, burning the outsides, leaving the insides of the fence posts untouched. Everything inside the fence was emerald green, and all the wooden structures were uncharred, and they were all spared. The Peshtigo fire is still considered the most devastating fire in U.S. history. Long after the drama of the fire, the sisters simply continued carrying on that mission given to Adele. And Adele died when she was 65 years old. So the shrine exists to continue this mission, to be a place of peace and protection and learning, specifically to teach those things that Mary said were necessary for salvation. In 2010, Bishop Ricken declared the apparitions worthy of belief. And in 2016, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops designated the grounds as a national shrine, making it the first national shrine in the U.S. with an approved Marian apparition. I come out here fairly often, especially when I have a difficulty or I need Mary's help or I need her direction. And I get such peace coming here, solace. And I ask people their stories, and still, she's working, she's working. This morning, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I came for prayers, but more so, I came for Thanksgiving. All of us have one thing in common. Everybody's saying they came because of their love for Mary. The peace and the tranquility and the love that I felt in Medjugorje, it's here also and then to know the miracle of what happened here, and then to start adding up all of the miracles that Our Lady has brought to the world. We've got to sit back and say, oh, she's our mother, she's taking care of us. We are under her mantle of protection. The Blessed Mother came here to champion Wisconsin for a reason, to protect America and to get America back on track, because America right now is going in the wrong direction. Sister Adele taught my great-grandfather his catechism. He would come to the chapel, and it's just left such an impact on me. My great-grandfather, he and his family came to the chapel during the fire. He was actually saved here, so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> I would recommend to read the basic message of Our Lady of Champion to Adele, to pray for the conversion of sinners, to make a general confession, to offer Holy Communion. Our Lord is calling you through Our Lady just to experience the peace and joy that He has in store for you, especially through the sacraments. The end of all of our prayers should be adoration to our Lord, worship to God. So uh, it's all for Jesus through Mary. Praise God. Now, speaking of Our Lady, her feast day is coming up this Monday, January 1st. So we want to show you a little clip that we did before answering the question, is Mary really the mother of God? Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, and welcome to Ask a Marian. Owen from Albany, New York asks, Father, how can we call Mary the mother of God? She didn't exist before God. He's always existed. So how could we say this? Well, Owen, before we answer that, we have to point out a few things about Christmas. You see, we have been in the Christmas octave, which is eight days celebrated 
as one feast day called Christmas. It started on December the 25th and went for eight days to January the 1st, which is Mary, the mother of God, a very big solemnity that we celebrate in our church. Now, why do we say this? And how can we call her this? Well, we have to ask you a question. Now, first of all, can we say that Jesus Christ was a human person? The answer is no. Actually, Jesus Christ is a divine person with a human nature. There is a difference. That's how the Catechism defines Jesus Christ. One person, two natures. Now, it is true, those natures are human and divine. God in one sense, or I should say Jesus in one sense, is both human and divine, but in his nature, his personhood is divine. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, we have how many gods? One God, you all know that. But how many persons? Three. God the Father is one person. God the Son is one person. Say that again. God the Son is one person. And God the Holy Spirit is one person. If Jesus was a human person, you'd have four persons in the Trinity. We know this isn't the case. So what happened? Well, when this one person, the second person of the Trinity, came to earth and was born of a woman, he united, which already his divine nature existed because he was a divine person and had a divine nature. This is the second person of the Trinity. But when he came to earth and was born as this little child, he assumed a human nature. So that one person, divine person, the second person of the Trinity, who already had a divine nature, at the hypostatic union, assumed a human nature and was born of a woman. That is the mystery of our faith. Now, when Mary gave birth, did she give birth to a person or a nature? And the answer is, you give birth as a mother to a person, not just a nature. So when Mary gave birth, she didn't give birth to two persons. She gave birth to one person, and that one person is divine. That is why we can call Mary the mother of God. She gave birth to that one person, and that one person was divine, who already had a divine nature, but then assumed a human nature. That is who Jesus Christ is, and that is our Savior. And that, Owen, is why we call Mary the mother of God. God bless you, and we hope to see you next week. And may Almighty God bless you in this Christmas season. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Brother Ryan, and this is Saints in Focus. Are you afraid of being canceled by friends, family, or coworkers because of your Catholic beliefs? If so, you have a friend in St. Thomas Becket, the 12th century Archbishop of Canterbury. St. Thomas was venerated for 400 years before Henry VIII canceled him, destroying his shrine, blotting out his name from books, and rumor has it, digging up his bones, burning them, and scattering the ashes. Yikes! What could possibly explain Henry's hatred for St. Thomas Becket, his venerated countryman? Let's find out. St. Thomas Becket was born in London in 1118. He worked for the Archbishop of Canterbury until a previous King Henry, Henry II, took notice of his excellent work and appointed him as his Lord Chancellor, his right-hand man. But tensions arose between the two when there was a question of Thomas becoming the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Thomas warned the king that, as Archbishop, he would have to fight for the rights of the church against that of the state. And at this time, there was a lot of tension between the two on questions of authority, taxation, and juridical rights. Well, despite Thomas's warning, Henry appointed him as Archbishop. And what happened? Conflict, just as Thomas had predicted. In fact, it got so bad that Becket fled to France, where he lived for six years. 
At one point, King Henry II, exasperated by Thomas's opposition, made a careless remark. He said something like, won't someone rid me of this troublesome priest? Hearing this comment, four knights of Henry's court took it as a commission, traveled to Canterbury, and slew the archbishop in his cathedral. I mentioned that 400 years after Thomas's death, he was canceled by Henry VIII. Why? Because when Henry VIII broke ties with the Catholic Church, he wanted to rebrand St. Thomas and all who opposed royal authority as traitors to the throne. Henry II took Thomas's life but gave the church a martyr. Henry VIII tried to take his reputation but instead proved its resilience. Now, most of us won't become archbishops and contend with stubborn monarchs, but our loyalty to Christ and his church will be tested. As St. Thomas said, without real effort, no one wins the crown, and we are all called to reign as saints in the kingdom of heaven. If we would rather have no friends than participate in gossip, if we would rather lose our jobs than compromise our views on sexual morality, if we would rather put aside our amusements and pleasures to raise kids with virtue and a rock-solid faith, then we will win a martyr's crown like St. Thomas. We will have died to ourselves and lived for Christ. St. Thomas Becket, pastor and martyr, pray for us. Well, on behalf of the Marian Fathers and all of us here at EWTN, Happy New Year to you and your loved ones. So please be with us next week because coming up soon is the very important feast of the baptism of Jesus. And we'll explain what all of that means. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.